You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Thank you for joining us. If you're here for Nestor Carbonell, you, you found the right place. If I messed up his name, he'll kill me. He's awesome. This Just, guy is so awesome. I, I met him at a con. He couldn't be nicer. He's not only a great actor, but he's a great guy. He's a director. He's a He does it all. But what a sweet man. And I've always been a fan. I've seen a lot of things he's been in. And uh, I'm a big fan. So listen to some stuff that we're going to talk about, and then we'll get into that. But uh, if you really enjoy the podcast, it helps us so much. If you write a review, subscribe, tell other people you really liked it and to give, a, give it a chance. Um, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, at Inside of You Pod on the Twitter. And uh, look, it's the SAG after strike. And uh, what that means for the podcast is a lot of these, all these as of now are pre-recorded, so we're okay. And we put a little disclaimer, but um, you know, uh, the podcast will continue. It's continuing. We've got permission. Other podcasts are doing it. We just have to find, uh, you know, you know, what's the word? Um, listen to the guidelines mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, follow, follow the follow the guidelines. Follow, 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 follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Mm -hmm. That was Snoop Dogg who said that. But um, but yeah, we've got a lot in the can, so nothing to worry about. We've got at least another couple of months before I need new guests. Mm -hmm. So no need to worry. But if you want to join Patreon to support the podcast and keep it afloat, like my patrons have done, <clears throat> patreon.com slash inside of you. Very important. Um, top tiers get, there's a lot of perks and we're adding perks, but the top tiers get a box sent for me every couple of months and a personalized note. Um, they get uh, YouTube lives where we, they ask questions. They, get to ask shit talking questions on that are now i think going to become a, a patron exclusive um and so many more things so join patreon support the podcast become a top tier patron if you want or just give it any way you can um i will be at a bunch of cons in september so go on my link tree on instagram the link link tree and you can see where i'll be i'll be all over so come see me i'd love to see you trying to get a big patreon gathering probably in dc um, even if it's for an hour or so, just to see all you guys, I would love that. Um, but yeah, that's what I'll say. That is what you said. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Inside of you online store, tons of cool merch, uh, new zip up jackets that were a bestseller inside of you. Ryan has one. I have one. I love them. They're the most comfortable things you'll ever wear. I promise you. Um, they're on sale along with a bunch of other cool, cool stuff. And um, I'm on the cameo as well. And uh, the band Sunspin, sunspin.com to get merch, Zooms, all that stuff. You can also get Zooms with me and Tom Welling on the um, Talkville podcast uh, website. Me? Uh, okay. I guess we should get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's time we get into it. Do you have it's, anything else you want to share? No, this you is- You were wearing the same shirt last week. I was. Was I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we are homely people oh god no this one's a fun one I, i'm excited for this one and by the way how are you guys doing uh you know i i don't ask all the time but i do care ryan mm -hmm. cares uh ryan are you, you you feel like your mental health is in a better place it's, it's in a place that's of constantly being worked on it's constantly sure. being worked on and i think that's good you're still with better help yep the, yeah some days are better than others yeah absolutely but it's important to keep doing it mm -hmm. um you know you're gonna have those weeks you're gonna have good weeks where you don't think you need therapy and then but, people tend to <laughs> not go to therapy oh I'll save a buck and i don't mm -hmm. need it because i feel good yeah but it's it's a it's a check-in it's like working on your body it's mm -hmm. like physical you know what i mean you gotta mm -hmm. you gotta keep that up man mm -hmm. um so i hope you're all doing well and taking care of yourself because you're the most important things if you're trying to take care of a million things and you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be good to anybody, including yourself. So I'm just uh, hoping you're uh, looking out for yourself. All right. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let's get inside of Nestor Carbonell. He's got a wonderful career and you're going to love this guy. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Hey folks, wanted to highlight something important before today's episode. In case you weren't aware, myself and many of the guests 
are on strike alongside SAG, AFTRA, and WGA. Today's episode and any we air before the strike ends were recorded before it began. So this is just a heads up in relation to some for the topics we may discuss. If you want more info on the strike, visit SAGAfterStrike.org. Now let's get into it. I want to make it like a sort of a uh, a retreat in a way. You come over, you put your feet up, you relax, we karaoke, we watch movies, we hang out in the back, we have drinks, we play games. You know, it's kind of like I'm a big kid and I just want, you know, my grandma's house was always open to everybody, but my parents, it wasn't. So I never was allowed to have friends over. It's interesting. So like what was, everything was meticulous and very You normal? know what's really weird? It just, it makes a lot of sense. So my mother, if you walked in the house, like perfect um, carpet, you know how the, Everything's the vacuum, calm. Yeah. it's perfect. Yeah. Everything looked perfect. Right. But if you ever opened a drawer or a cabinet or a, the, everything would fall apart. I mean, it was just in shambles, a mess. But was it disorganized or just like bro- broken? Uh, just disorganized in the, in the drawer. You realize, oh my God, this is broken and just p- things stuffed in there. Like everything on the outside. And it, you know, it's, it's funny. We're recording, right? Mm-hmm. It's funny because... A lot of times I look at myself and I go, okay. And my therapist said this. They're like, you need to keep everything around you in order. You need to be, you know, I guess meticulous is the word you use. Sure. But um, if everything around you is not in order, you will not be in order. And so it's it seems to me like there's so much going on in my mind. Um, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of, you know, I grew up with a lot of dysfunction and stuff that I talk about. But uh I just, this is so funny. I'm just thinking about this for the first time, but my mother, everything on the outside appeared. So it was almost like her personality. She would pretend that I've got everything going on and she, she didn't, she like inside, she was like dealing with a lot of stuff and anxiety and, you know, just, so I wonder how many people do that. Like how many people sort of like, Hey, you walk in their house is really clean and, but they're a mess. Well, let's start with Instagram. (laughs) I mean, you know, yeah. you know that that is sort of an extension of what people of of essentially what you're saying your mom would would do is, is you paint a picture for the outside world that isn't entirely accurate, you know. Right. And and it's you know I think that a lot of us do that, you know. I mean, a, a lot of us are. I, I no, I'm certainly guilty of that. And then you have to check yourself. You have to be like, dude, let's get real. You know, there's uh, it's not it's not what I'm portraying all the time. Right. And. As, as I know you know, because you're, you're such a, I mean, I, I just, you know, from, from when I met you, you know, in Cincinnati, you, when you talk to people, you want to get at the truth. You want to, and, and you're open about how you truthfully are as well, which disarms people in a great way and allows them to open up. And that is how you connect with people ultimately. When I meet people for the first time, you know, usually everything's surface. You know, it's like, yeah. you, you don't have time to like, you know, it's usually, hey, how you doing? No one's going to be like, oh, not great. You're like, oh, shit, what happened? You know, usually it's just like, hey, nice to meet you. Oh, yeah, great. Oh, you know, when it's like. Well, it's a quick one. Yes. Yeah, of course. But like I, when I met you, however brief, and we talked a bit, a little bit, and we were on the plane together. Yeah. But I And I told Ryan, I go, this guy is like the most down to earth, just, I mean, it just feels like you're just a regular good guy who. I mean, on the outside, at least, on the looks outside. like he has shit together. <laughs> no, but uh, thank you. But no, I'm I'm like everyone else, you know, you know, full of a thousand contradictions, you know, uh, a mess many days, sometimes less so than others, you know. When you say a mess, what does I that mean, mean? I mean, you know, like anything, you know, I, I mean, I, I struggle with just uh you know any any the typical fears that people struggle with you know day to day the voices in your head that they're saying that the criticisms and all that stuff and a lot of it is like okay let's manage those you know and you know you pick up things along the way and you you lean on things that you've learned but by and large you know for for me you know and as an actor you know ryan you're an actor as well right yeah ish (laughs) Yes, you are. <laughs> I've, I've been on the YouTube, yes. Yes, you are. I've been, at, I've been on at, the YouTube. Or, or are you saying like in life, like, yeah. Sure. <laughs> We're all I, putting on a face, that I, kind of thing. Well, there's that too. There's the double entendre. But you, yeah. you know, but you know, in, in this business, you know, whether it's on YouTube and any medium, you know, it's it's tough. And it's tough not to hear the, 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 the voices of criticism in your head. And how do you navigate those things? And how do you deal with anxiety? And how do you deal with, 
you know, a, a career that is like, it's so unpredictable. You don't know, there's no consistency necessarily, unless you get on a show and you hope that there's level of consistency there. And even then- That goes away. That goes away. It's ephemeral. Everything's ephemeral. There's no question. You so, know, um, what's crazy is I look at your, um, by the way, how would you say your name? Like the real way you say it. Uh, Nestor Carbonell. No, in, in English. <laughs> I mean, like if you were in Cuba or you were somewhere, like, how would you say it? Uh, my, my parents would say Nestor Carbonell. Nestor Carbonell. Nestor, yeah, Carbonell. there's an accent on the E if you want to throw that out. So Nestor Carbonell, but you know, I mean, it's Nestor Carbonell or many other things that people have called me, it's fine. What's crazy <laughs> is when I first got to see you on TV, I think the first time I saw you, you've been in tons of stuff and I know I'm, I've seen you, but the, the role that really probably everybody was like, whoa, it was lost, right? That was the big one, one of the big ones. I mean, oh, you were on Suddenly Susan, Susan yeah. you were on yeah. tons of stuff, but like no, the most impact. For sure, I mean, I yeah, that that opened up the world, for, right. certainly for TV, for me in a different way. But yeah. I had, I'm sure a lot of other people didn't realize that, you know, you had this, uh, I, I didn't know you spoke like that, you could speak Spanish like that, you could speak, you know, that you, you, where your roots are. If you just look at you, Right. You, you don't think that you're like oh, I'm, I'm sure maybe he's, is it Italian? Is it is or it Jewish is it, is it, or is he, is he, is he, yeah yeah. Is, yeah yeah? And then you start speaking. I'm like Everson. How did he learn all that? <laughs> well, he actually speaks the language. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, no, well, thank it's you. It's a I, cool thing. Thank you, bud. I I mean I I I was born to Cuban uh, exiles who exiled Cuba in 1960. My parents both you know exiled. They met actually. Was that hard to do by the way? What, what, to what, leave Cuba? For them it was brutal. I bet they they I mean they had to. They had to what what they were facing at the time, you know. I mean but our our family's history there is 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 pretty tr is is very tragic, you know, certainly within the after the Castro's revolution, I had an uncle who was executed by Castro. Another one was uh, in prison for seventeen years. You know, uh, was this your dad's brother? My dad's uh, cousin. Cousin. Your dad's cousin. cousin. Absolutely. And my father participated in the Bay of Pigs. Uh, uncle wow. in prison for seventeen years and tortured for rejecting indoctrination into Marxism. So we have a, a long history of you know. Wow. So they they fled you know hoping to return or fight for you know freedom in Cuba and you know and they didn't you know they never returned um, because of, you know the Bay of Pigs fiasco and so so yeah it was brutal for them to leave. My mom was fifteen you know didn't speak a, much English at all. So uh, and, and they moved here. Yeah, they, my mom landed in, in New York, no, in Miami first in, in different homes. Like they were just sent to like, if there's an aunt or uncle living there at the time or had a, a place temper with the, the idea that they were gonna go back, that there was no way that the US would allow this, you know, Marxist you know, stronghold, you know, 90 miles off their shore. Right. And, and they never went back. My mom didn't see her mom, my grandmother for nine years. So, oh, cause her mother stayed in Cuba and sent the kids off to relatives in, in Miami. So so it was really tough for them. So I grew up with those stories, you know, and it's- Was it hard for them in the United States? Cause people are like, oh, you're Cuban. Oh, we're, we're at war with Cuba. We're, there's this, was there any of that? I, like oh, sort of like uh, Pearl Harbor-ish, you know, Japanese Americans and dealing with all that shit. I know that there were, there were there was tough transitions, you know, in the beginning in Florida, you know, I mean, there's a language barrier. There's, you're right. Anytime an, a new immigrant group or exile group comes in, there's always like, you know, what do we do with this? You know, and and understandably, you just, you don't know, and to a certain extent, who the, you know, why they're here, what's going on. So, I could see, you know, why, I could I could I could understand why that that would happen. So yeah, they they encountered some of that, uh, and yet they also encountered a country that opened them up, you know, were open to them with yeah. open arms, and quickly embraced it as their own. And thank God for this country, you know what I mean? And thank God that this country was here for them because uh, they would never have had those opportunities anywhere else. Yeah. Were you privy, I mean, to seeing the strength of your parents? Was it pretty tr Was pretty apparent how strong they were and how hardworking they were and how, you know, was that apparent to you? It's a great question, man. And, I, and I'd love to hear your end of this too uh, on, on well, your parents. Well, I don't know if you do. I do. <laughs> well, I do, because right. I'm, I'm, well. No, 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 I, I, know. I, I wanna, I consider myself incredibly lucky because they, they didn't, they came with nothing. They came with what they had in their pockets. They they came from families that were prominent in Cuba politically and and you know, and they'd done well over the years. Um, they lost it all. 
it was all taken uh, by Castro. So, so they, they had money and they were doing really well in Cuba. Yeah, yeah. like yes, they, they were. Yes, and they they and they were fighting for democracy. They were fighting against the incumbent dictator who was Batista, right. as much as they were against Castro. They're trying to restore democracy. My, so you know, so they were. Yeah, they were. They were, but they lost it all. Like every Cuban exile, they came with what they had in their pockets. So I grew up with those stories, with stories of them having nothing. Uh, my, the only thing my father did have was it was a great education. And that's no small yeah. thing. That is no small thing. This show is sponsored by Better Help. Sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices and the path forward isn't always clear. Whether you're dealing with decisions around your career, your relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, so it's convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's better H E L P betterhelp.com slash inside. This message is sponsored by discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from discover discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data and they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. So, you know, they, they, my, they both worked so hard, incredibly hard. Uh, my mom was a tour guide at Rockefeller Center. My dad, you know, had a law degree. He was, he was nine years older than her. So at he least- He went to Harvard, right? He went to Harvard and he got his master's there. So he- And your sister went to Harvard. He got a, she got a master's degree And you well. went to Harvard. That's so annoying, I know. It's I know. not annoying. It's like, wow. I mean, it almost seems like my, the real reason I'm sort of saying that is because what I'm thinking is, how hard on you would it have been to see your your parents? And I want you to keep talking about what you were talking no, about, no but seeing them how hard they were in their education and your dad being a lawyer. But also, was it a stress on you that I have to follow in my father's footsteps of the education and I have to work really hard and I have to, was it ingrained in you? You know, it's another great question. <laughs> Dude, you're full of great questions. You really are. Like, get ready for the bad <laughs> ones. Get ready for the bad ones. No, because it, it, yeah, I was very lucky in the sense that my father, struck this balance and my mother as well where it was not about the result and it was always about the effort i remember like i had we, we lived we had the privilege of living in london three different times because my dad worked for pepsi international we were moved all over the world right and i remember we were i was there it was third or fourth grade and i was in the american school in london at one point and he I, you know he came back my grades came in and he's like okay we need to talk about this i go what he goes I, the, this, the, the B minus, the C plus here, I don't care about that. He goes, it's this section here on effort where you have a C, that's the one that bothers me. Hmm. And I was like, and it sank in, I go, what? He goes, I don't care about the result. I want you to work hard, whatever you do. And since that moment, it's interesting how that stayed with me. I was like, okay, I'll just work hard. I'll just work hard. I work hard. And and it and it it did stay with me. So I never had that. They never imposed on me. You have to go to this this school or that school. And it was never about that. But it was understood that that we were expected to work our butts off, you know, and not take these opportunities for granted. That's awesome. What about you? To have, I, I wanna, <laughs> well, this is uh, the podcast about you. No, uh, no, <laughs> it's look, a give look, and take. People look. Um, I didn't come from a very. Um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say normal family. I, you know, definitely dysfunctional as I talked about ad nauseum. But you know, in terms of education, um, I, I've always had attention deficit disorder. I've always, I mean, I know sometimes it feels like an excuse to people, like everybody's got a deficit. If you get to know me, like Ryan, or if you get to know, you know, it's like squirrel. It's like it's really hard for me to focus. And being a child, uh, you know, I wasn't drugged up, which I'm grateful for. But at the same time, um, there wasn't a lot of patience. 
in my household. No one sat me down and said, hey, you know, let's just take our time, take a deep breath. Let's learn this and let's, you know, and no, it, I had, there was no, it was just like, I'm not getting good grades. Why? I don't know. Get better grades. There wasn't any of that. So for me, it was just growing up feeling really stupid. Like I felt I wasn't intelligent. I, I can't do things and my grades are bad. Why can't I do even simple things? And no, it's like, it's almost like no one just really paid enough attention or any attention. So I felt like I was colorblind, yet I was going to art class and getting D's and F's. Mm -hmm. And no one was figuring it out. And I'm like, why are you failing the color wheel? Primary colors, secondary colors. I was like, it's all, I don't know what any of this means. I, so it just felt like I had a learning uh, okay. deficiency. And so I look back and I definitely am able now to think, hey, you didn't have the things you needed as a child. Right. You didn't have the patience. You didn't have the understanding and the love and all the things that a child in his developmental stages needs. So I'm aware of that and it comforts me knowing that, you know, that was unfortunate and it wasn't my fault and I wasn't dumb. I just didn't have the right circumstances. Right. I think my parents did the best they could. Right. You know, my dad worked, never missed a day of work, worked right. from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., came home, had dinner, you know, you know, hopefully he was in a good mood. Uh, and then I left and I was, so we didn't have really the best relationship. It wasn't really affectionate or anything like that. So it's different. It's different. Um, um, but I do, I am, what's the word? I respect that my father really worked hard and provided for his family. But I think um, some men or women think that just providing alone, you're a great parent. If I put a roof over your head right. and I give you the things you need, that means I'm a good parent. And that's not true. It's more about the affection, the love, the understanding, the patience, all the things that go into parenting. And I just think, think he knew that. They did know that. And my mother, I think, was the center of attention. She wasn't ready. To, she shouldn't have had children. You know what I mean? She, she, was, really, she yeah. was out for herself. She was more in, interested in her life than she was ours. And that's just yeah. that's just reality. I don't I don't hate her for it. No. It's just like that's that. so it's a different mentality. That's why I was like hey listen. Night and day. And look, it, uh, listen, I'm a, I'm a parent now and right. God knows uh, <laughs> you make mistakes. Uh, uh do I ever. Man, and um constantly and I think what's the old adage that you try and screw up your kids uh, half as much as you thought you were screwing up. <laughs> yeah. So uh yeah, I don't know if I'm doing <laughs> how I'm doing on that regard. Or are you patient with them? You know, I try. I try. Listen, I, you know, there are things I think I do better than other things. And what's your strength? What's my strength? I I try to lead by example. I try. I don't always. Right. Um, um, I try to uh, own up to my mistakes and, and let them know, you know, I just messed up. You realize that and I'm owning it. Things like that. If they ask you a question, if they say, dad, did you ever drink? Would you go? Yes, I did. Yeah, and that's an interesting question, though. It depends at what age. Of course. You know, Dad, you, are you a drunk? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. uh, you're eight years old. Not no, right I'm now. not. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, no, that's a really layered and interesting question because I think there is a time when you can tell them that stuff. Sure, you know? sure, sure. You know, like anything. But no, I think in terms of if the, uh, you know, trying to pass on things that I find helpful, uh, you know, particularly as we were talking about things that are challenging in this industry, just, like you know how to deal with mental health you know mm -hmm. how to how to deal with you know the voices of criticism how to deal with anxiety you know things that i think i find helpful uh things that i find you know and you know how the the old adage that success leaves footsteps is seeing how other people have done it you know and 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 being open to the world and saying look you know you take from this example and this example being malleable right just malleable sort of... make your bed you know at least yeah. if you had a bad day at least you know you made your bed yeah, you know, it's things like that, or it's or it's gratitude. I know I I listened to your interview with Robert Patrick. It was amazing, oh, and thanks. yeah, it was beautiful. And he spoke about that about how he gets up in the morning and he prays and he gets on, he puts a, knee, a, a pillow on it and he kneels on it and, and he and he thanks God for waking up that morning. Do you do that? You know, I don't do that specifically, but you know, not not too long ago, we've been implementing this notion of like three things that you're grateful for at the you know when when we have a meal. That's awesome. And it's and it it does affect your day. You know, if you start the day or at least, or even in the middle of the day, if you do that, it puts everything in perspective. It's just, you know, and 
you know, so so that the someone else the other day, I, we were having dinner and someone, I, I'm sure this is something a lot of people know about. I didn't know about this, but he said, instead of saying, I got to do this, you say, I get to do this. I got to- Ryan, think about that when you wake up and like, I got to go do this damn podcast. Hey, I get to do this podcast. It's kind of fun. <laughs> it, 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 it's incredible. I need to do that too. Not not the easiest. You, you got to do that. No, you yeah. get to do that. <laughs> yeah, I get to do that. I got to do. No, I get and to you do get that. To do I get that to make too. that choice. You get to make that choice. <laughs> yeah, to yeah. Just get instead of have to. And it's amazing how a shift in a word, you know, the way you ascribe a word, you know, how 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 it changes the meaning or your. So it's things like that that I hope as a parent that I'm able to impart on them. You know that that I think are more helpful than not. When did you decide? Like, uh, I'm sure you told the story, but. You know, you got a degree in English, right? Did you get your master's in Harvard? No, I just, it was just, uh, it was just a bachelor of arts. Yeah, bachelor of bachelor arts. arts. Yeah, but were you arts. doing theater at Harvard? No, here's the thing at, 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 at school in Harvard at the time is that there was not much of a, uh, an acting program at all. I didn't know what I was, I wanted to do. All I knew was I, you know, I, I applied to all these schools, you know, and then I was like, okay, I guess I'll go there, you know, and I had no clue. I had no idea. I didn't know that. Uh, I had no, I'd never acted up, you know, at, at that point. I hadn't even been in a school play. I had no interest in it. And then, and I, I thought I'd be a lawyer. You know, I thought I'd go into some kind of business. And then there was one elective at the time at Harvard uh, by, uh, that was um, taught by this man named David Wheeler, who was an incredible acting coach. I think he coached Pacino for years. And, wow. you know, he was, he was well known. And I didn't know anything about him at the time, but I, you know, later found out, oh, uh, he's like a big, he's like a big deal. Yeah. And he uh, introduced me to this book, you know, the class, uh, Meisner on acting, Sanford Meisner on acting. And it wasn't until I read that book, you know, you know, front to co you know, back, front cover to back, that I realized, wow, this is something I want to explore. And there was nothing else, uh, no other electives at Harvard at the time. There was one other one at the uh, American Repertory Theater that you could take a Shakespeare thing. That was it. Other than that, there people were doing uh, plays in the basements of the houses. So what'd you do? So I did plays in the basements of the really? houses. Yeah, <laughs> you did that. And then eventually, I was like, I got to study this technique, you know. And so I had to wait until I graduated, which was a bummer. But, you know, but I couldn't wait. And I, I did, I was like, I got to finish for my parents' sake. Cause I was like, there's nothing here is going to be particularly applicable to what I want to do, but I can't do that to my parents now. And, and did I, they know you were doing this plays in the basement or did they, you they, knew. They, they knew. knew. They did knew. they see you ever? No, because yeah, it was I mean, in the basement. The ba Who's going to go to the basement? <laughs> you know, the basement. You know, it's not like I was selling out the ART. You know, <laughs> so so no, so I I dropped the bomb on them. You know, and I don't know how that went over with you. You know, because I I think I'd I'd heard you say that. Yeah, I just remember we were in Denny's after I did a play. I think it was Prelude to a Kiss or something, and I just looked at my dad. And I was like, I'm going to be an actor, and he goes, Eat your steak, and that was it. And hold on, was this? You went to college, right? You went to Indiana? Yeah, I went to Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, Kentucky. All of it. Yeah, Kentucky. Every, my life it. is just a lot of lucky in the right place at the right time, making the right decisions, and some of it being very prepared, luckily. It was just a lot of, you know, just things that just happened that I, I could have gone in so many different directions. Not many. It would have been like I would have been a DJ at a roller rink. Or a um, working at a go kart shop, or nothing, nothing wrong with Wesselman's that. Grocery, Second Groceries, sure. or working at Sunoco right. um, gas station, and you know it was one of those things where all of a sudden, uh, you know, one of my, this guy that lived down the street goes, "Hey," and he was popular. Hey, you wanna? Hey, I go to Western Kentucky, man. We'll be roommates. I'm going. I go okay, and I just. And I got in. It was easy to get in, and so, then I went there, and that's so, why I went to college. <laughs> and did you uh, did you apply to other schools, or that was just the one? Just like that, that was, was it. That was that was amazing. It. that was it. But it was an easy school to get into. And by the way, I'm glad it was that school because I learned so much. Because you know, college really isn't all about, or the majority isn't about, you know, great grades, and and it's really about how learning how to be social, learning how, meeting people that are on the same wavelength, being creative, um, growing up. There's so many other variables. It's just not, I got to study and get to do this to get to this job. Of course, there's that. But, you know, I think it's experience and experience not only with, with, with you know, work, but experience with who you are and growing up and becoming the individual that, you know, you're destined to be. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's the first time for most people that they're out of the house and they're 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 commuting, they're living with people, you know, roughly the same age, 
and they were kind of on their own ish, you know. Mm -hmm. So there is that. You're right. All the interpersonal stuff, all that social stuff, is it's sort of the first time you're exposed. You're kind of thrown into the, the deep yeah. end in that regard. So that is, yeah. And, but you're right. I mean, for those who are studying, for you and I, who went for more of a bachelor arts degree, it's less about okay, what grade you're going to get, unless you're going to go into mm -hmm. academia and some some level. But yeah, for the people who are trying to, you know, who are, who are going to become doctors, obviously lawyers, you know, they got to put the work in. You got engineers. There's, for there's, me, there's, there's no way around. That, it. that wasn't on the table. No, well, we were neither. From, it wasn't for no. me either. I was not a math whiz or anything like that. So I was never twelve be. times eleven. One hundred thirty-two. I think that's right. Yeah, because yeah. uh, then you add 12, 144 is 12 yeah. times 12. So yeah. I mean, nicely you know, done. Hey, hey, you know. But what, what, what uh, did you have? Like, I'm obviously doing these plays in the basement and you're getting some. It, was there one person in particular that you remember going, he looks at you and says, or she and says, hey, you've got something there. I think you should do that. Was there, because we all need that person. Did it's you such a great um yeah it's a it's a really good it's a great point because i've never thought of it like that you had to have someone along yeah, the way even think, if you started to make it you were where wherever you know, that trajectory you know i don't know that there's any one individual who said this like dude you gotta you have to pursue this you know i, I was terrible in the beginning i was awful oh, you know of course. It, was, it was i was like what am i i don't you know i was in my head i was like what is nervous nervous all of the above i wanted it you know once i knew i loved it i wanted it too much all those pitfalls you know i fell into and it it just was a gradual sort of progression of i thought of like okay you know i'll find this i'm gonna find it you know so there was one guy at at harvard who did have his own company and he used students his name was eric engel and he did do a few productions that were not in the basement and he was pretty great and i remember i remember he had an impact on me because I, I just I don't know that that was one one guy who who de who definitely did. Um, so yeah, I, I, it maybe maybe it was Eric Engel. It might have been Eric Engel. There you Look go. Look at that. You haven't thought about that name for a while. Man, have it's you? been a long time since I thought about Eric. Yeah. Um, what is the first gig you got that you, you're getting paid? You're on TV. It's something like. Uh, do you remember that moment when you found out you got it for the first time? I want to hear about yours too. All right. Okay. Go ahead. All right, we will trade. Okay, but my this one is. It, I find I thought it was quite epic because I was a kid, you know, I already knew what I wanted. So I, in, in the summers, my parents live in Greenwich, Connecticut. So not a long commute to New York City. I was able to get a waitering job. I met waiters who had commercial agents. I got with a commercial agent, started going out for commercials in the summer. And so I went up for all these, you know, national commercials for, you know, just an all American kid. And I just wasn't I wasn't getting the all-American roles. You know, I wasn't even getting close callbacks. And a buddy of mine who would book a bunch of these, he's like, dude, you know, you gotta work the, the Latin angle, you gotta work that Latino angle. And I go, yeah, you know, they are gonna send me to some, you know, Spanish speaking ones. He goes, yeah, dude. And he goes, whatever you do, you know, you've seen those things. They're, they're really like sort of exuberant. They're just really, he goes, you just, man, you just go for it. I go, really? He goes, yeah, man, you just go for it. So I went up for the Zest commercial. And I'm zest right. fully clean. Exactly. You're not fully clean until you're zest fully clean. Okay, good. so try doing that in Spanish. And so, can you do it? Yeah. Si usted se baña con jabón, mire lo que se pierde. Yes. So, so that was the copy, <laughs> and it was like I remember like going in there, getting this copy, and there's like 400 dudes had signed up before me. I'm like, oh, oh my god. And then I, I had my friend in my head saying, no, you got to, you got to. And I had like this awful like cliched moment in in the mirror outside you know in the in the in the, uh, in, the uh, in the bathroom of the outside the casting office now okay dude go for this thing you know you're gonna go for it you're gonna go for it and i did and i went for it and i got in there and i go si usted se baña con jabón mire lo que se pierde and the casting director goes great give me more so i like i just kept amping it up si usted se baña con jabón mire lo que se pierde she goes that's amazing so i went home i booked the job i was i was like 19 it was i was gonna get my sag card I was over the moon. I was like jumping up and down. I got the calls like, I, 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 where are you? You know? I get to this set and I remember meeting the director and he goes to me, hey, do you remember what you did in the audition? I go, yeah. He goes, don't do that. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. What? I was like, what? He goes, don't do that. I go, oh, okay, we're, we're not going to do that. I go, obviously they just hired me for my look or my, you know, I don't know. my. But my, it was in Spanish. Like, it wasn't Spanish. I just had to do it. So you just did it very <laughs> calm down. That is it. I, I brought it down a few notches, but it was to me, I, I hit the lottery, you know, and, and I was, it ran for a while. It ran, it ran for enough. They didn't pay much. The, the, the Spanish ones so don't pay what? much. But Something. who cares, man? It was exactly, it was like, it's more than I was waking up making as a waiter. And it was 
my SAG card, and I was 19, That's and I was beautiful. Like, I want to hear yours. You know, I think I got this part on. It was called. It was a CBS show. Matt Waters educating Matt Waters with Montel Williams. Oh wow! <laughs> and he was the lead, and um, Selma Blair was in the episode. It was just an oh, episode. Wow. It was the only. It's one of the few episodes of television I've done, if not as a but as a guest star. Oh, really? And I had the best time. We shot for like two weeks, and I was just in heaven. I got to improvise and have fun. I felt like I was a kid. I didn't care about where the camera was, what it was doing, how I looked. I just was enjoying life. Oh. And you know, I made like I remember it was like eighteen hundred bucks for the episode, <clears throat> and I was like, oh my that, lord, that's amazing. Actually, rewind that. My first gig was. I was on Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and this is when nobody wow. listened to him. Okay. Nobody. Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and the character, I was a character who didn't make the show, but they still showed the character. So it was two- That's funny. It was the Amsterdam kids, and it was two kids who were misinformed about Amsterdam's liberal social policies. Maybe I'll put this on air. It's And it was just like, hey, Conan, man. I had this long hair down to my shoulders. I'm like, he's like, yeah, so it's the Amsterdam kids, folks. And I go, yeah, Conan, you know, man, in Amsterdam, you could just squat down in the middle of the street and take a dump, <laughs> and no one will care, man. It's performance art, Conan. He's like, no, no, no. That, that's not true. He's, no, it's true. And we I went on and on and it turned into like six episodes what? and it was so heartbroken when they stopped but you know what kind of always bothered me I, I was a guest on Conan O'Brien and I, and I like Conan but uh we did a pre-interview you know the pre-interviews right. yeah. and I said oh I have a great story because I used to be uh you know recurring character when the show when he was just first he goes and it comes back to me he goes yeah Conan doesn't want to talk about that he doesn't like to talk about that old I go it's epic. I was on. Like, it's epic. I yeah. never understood it, but I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about. I guess today's news." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. It was fine. It was fine. But um, that, so that when you booked that, what was that for you emotionally? And how did how did you tell your parents? Did you tell them? Like, I still have the message. Um, oh wow! You know, they. I don't remember them going, "Wow, this is great. You're playing this, you know, character on the show that nobody watches." I don't remember them being. But I remember my friend Kent Brenneman left a message, which I still have, and he goes, Rosenbaum, <laughs> good Lord, son. I'm turning on the TV, and I oh, see man. you on there, on this Conan or whatever. <laughs> Dude, give me a call. And I gave him a call. I hadn't talked to him for a while, and he was a good buddy growing up, and after after that, we just oh, remained amazing, close dude. friends. But I remember I was like, wow, he's excited. Uh, so it's always fun when your friends are excited or your friends might watch a show that you do or, cause most of the time they're like, eh, most of the time you do a lot of work that no one, that goes unnoticed. Sure. Like most people don't have time. Like, I'm like, hey man, I'm doing this. Everybody well, watch. You and nobody watches. Do you ask your friends and family to watch stuff you do? No, very, very seldom. Uh, you know, with music, I'll say, I, I, the first album, I was like, hey, guys, we worked really hard. Could everybody do this? You know, I sent out like 50 emails to friends, right. just a, a shit thing. And, yeah. you know, but I, I, I don't really do that a lot. Right. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't say, hey, watch this, do this. Yeah. I just kind of like, you know, if they know a minute, you know, you hope they'd go see it. It's interesting. I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I do do some, you know, obviously the Instagram, the, the you know, and, but I feel, and I'm wondering if it's if it's more of you know you don't want to you know burden people with like having to watch it as much as it is preserving that fourth wall, so that when you're performing, you're not thinking about like who's going to be watching this. You're, mm -hmm. you're you're in the moment. Yeah, I think if you think too much sometimes, and like having people on set always bothered me. Can't have it. And I and I have had it before. Like even at a convention that I was at, so one of my friends. You know, hey, can me and the family? And I hadn't seen them in so long, and they right. moved, and I, I, I felt like I have to see them. Right. But you know, it was, it was, it was like you know, I had to. It's energy. It's a lot of energy, and and when they're on the set, no. you know, it's always like someone's watching me. I can't really focus. I'm not. Well, you're not I'm, in it. You, I'm not in it. Have you done that before and regretted it? Oh yeah, completely. Yeah, no, 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 no one. You know, now no one anymore. No one. No comes anymore. On set. And now with COVID, you can't anyway. Right. But even right. before that, for, yeah, very also 
you know, it, it, you know, after a half hour of craft service and them hanging out, they're trail, bored. They're bored out Everybody's of their skull. Everybody's bored. No, no one cares. Bored. It's like no one wants to visit. You're somebody. doing this scene for four hours now. Exactly right. Yes. Are they going to move on? Yeah. I'm like, I hope so. <laughs> now you know that it's not that glamorous. Did you ever deal with like, I mean, we're getting into like, you know, the career and stuff, because I know you did a lot of TV guest stars. I know yeah. you did a lot. You soap opera and you did all these things. Um, were you always, did you? Were you excited about the things as they started happening or was there a time when you said, oh, fuck, another guest star for this? When am I going to nah. get, or were you always kind of excited and eager and like living in the moment? You know, I mean. I get to do this. I always got to do those guest stars. And no, listen, there was a time when when you're like, no, no, I, I don't know that I ever fully, fully, you know, took those opportunities for granted, especially at the time because it was, I was trying to build you know, uh, you know, a resume and, and also trying to, and it was, it was, with a guest spot, usually it was like, oh, I haven't played this role before. This this might be interesting. So it was, you know, and at the time it was really the only way to cobble together a year. It was like, you want to book, uh, you know, guest spot and that kind of thing. I'll tell you the most impactful guest spot that turned into probably one of the biggest opportunities of my life was was Lost. You were a guest star. Lost was, Lost was, I'll tell you quickly how that happened. I, my wife was a huge fan of the show. I'd watched the pilot and I was like, cool, but I lost the thread. So I, I stopped watching, you know, a few episodes in, but she was like a devoted fan. And then- Me uh, too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and, and uh, a year and a half into her- And I like the ending. I don't care what thank, people say. Thank you for that. I you, really did. You and me both. Um, so you were along for the emotional ride. I, exactly. I'm really go. emotional well, at the end. Well, there yeah. you go. So, so I remember she said, look, and she was acting at the time. She goes, if either one of us gets- a, a job on that show. We're all going to Hawaii. If it's a guest spot, we're all going. That's the rule. And I'm like, all right, Shannon. All right, fair enough. Sure enough, I get the I get an audition. This is uh, the beginning of season three, and I'm like, oh man. And we had to go to a, a kids orientation for uh, for a preschool for our you know, oldest son. And we're like, I I, I got to do this this audition. It's 13 pages of material. I go, I'll never know this by tomorrow. I get, it's, it's not going to happen. And my wife's like, just don't say no. Anyway, long story short. I looked at the material. Oh, I you looked, didn't have it memorized. No, it wasn't. I was not book. And then I woke up in the morning saying, "There's no way I'm going in on this thing and blowing my shot on Lost and this and that." And then I read it and I was like, "You know what? To hell with it. I'm going to go." And I bailed on my kids' uh, education basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, I'm, nice. "I'm going in this room." And I didn't know the material all that. I certainly didn't know off book. I knew the, the essence of it. Go in there, but usually I want to. I don't know how about you. I like to be off book. Look, I have to be off book, I think, you know, okay. and, uh, and the thing is, it's I, I've talked about this, but it's not easy for me to learn lines as fast as most people, but okay. I like to be off book. Yes, always, always, yeah, but go ahead. So you can relax and you can, yeah. and you can play yes. and, you, and you can truly be there. Of course. I, I, and most actors do, not all, but most. And so I wasn't obviously, and I go in there and I, and then I see guys who are completely different age, you know, uh, you know, uh, race, everything, you know, types. And we're like, wow, this is, I don't know what, I don't know what they know what they want necessarily for this role. I was like, I'll just do my thing. And I went in there and it was one of those, I'm sure you've had these where you're like, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen. And it, it, it somehow comes together in the room. It doesn't always happen. <laughs> Certainly not for me. But I was like, I think that came together. I think there was some connecting and I think it kind of worked, but you never know. But sure enough, I get the I get the yes, and I'm like yeah, you know, and I, it was almost like that Zest commercial. I had that same sort of reaction. He's like we're going, to, I'm going to Hawaii. My wife's like we're all going. I was like okay, we're uh, all going. yeah. So we all went for the guest spot. Sure, you know, did this backstory for uh, you know Elizabeth Mitchell's character, and I was like that's it. I'll never. I'm not coming. Man, I was in a backstory. There's no way. And then I get a call five weeks later. They want you back on the island in present time, and that changed everything. So that there was an opportunity. There was when they said that. At that point, I was like. What does this mean? Because is it one episode? They said no. They just said they couldn't say, and they didn't know. They didn't know, and where. they wouldn't give you a guarantee of at least three. No, there was nothing. No, there you was just no. went. I just went, and I was like, I'm not going to question this. We're we're just gonna we're gonna go with the flow, and I went, and then I kept coming back and coming back, and then the role sort of is this role that was shrouded in mystery, and so I benefited from that because it was like, well, who the hell is this guy? He's weird. Such looks, a cool, weird. Looks like he's got of, eyeliner on. Uh, you know, <laughs> you hear that a lot because you have. I wish you don't understand. You've got the best eyebrows, eyelashes. I mean, you're just so like you look at you're like you're striking. I, but for me, Thank I have you, to have buddy. my friend Joe come over and darken oh, my eyebrows. On, I look man. like an albino. I swear to God, she darkens my eyebrows. 
I, when I'm on set, they have to do that. They have to, you know, I'm just kind of like plain Jane here. But no, anyway, man. go ahead. So that becomes something, but they still don't make you a regular till season six. And in fact, the head of uh, ABC, then they were like, no more guest stars for him. Or they were like, it was, it was like, you know, you. it, it was during the writer's strike and oh. a lot of shit was going on. But did you ever think you could be a regular? Well, it's interesting how this how this happens, you know. And this have is, you told this? I don't think I've told this particular part of of of, oh, good. of how this works out. So it they didn't know. To, and to be fair to the writers, they they didn't know where the role was going. They, they sort of went with it. They knew where the show was ending and where it was beginning. It was going to start on Jack's eye and then and on his eye. And emotionally, they knew and and thematically, they knew everything else was movable parts. And which was what was amazing about the show is that you know they they it's like what. Uh, what uh, Damon said is like, you know, once they, you know, they, they hit the walls, they started to, you know, they're like, they're, they're boxed in. Well, they started to climb up the walls. And so, so they were so inventive and, and the show was so rich in that way. And it was amazing. And my character benefited from that. So lo and behold, it gets to a, a point where, you know, it's, I love guesting on it. I've been recurring on it now for a season a, a bit, but I need, I need pilot. I need to get a pilot. I need pilot money if they're not going to commit to anything. You know, I got to support the family. My, yeah. my wife had just, you know, uh, essentially quit, you know, acting. So I was like, it's on me now. I got to get at least a pilot fee, if not a pilot that goes to start paying for these schools and, you know, you know, and just life. And so I was like, well, I'll just, you know, and so I did this pilot called or, or, or Kane for CBS. Kane. It's about uh, a Cuban family of sugar, you know, uh, in the sugar business in Florida and uh, with Jimmy Smits and Hector Elizondo, Rita Moreno. Awesome. It's a great cast, amazing cast. And, um, but I was like, I hope this doesn't jeopardize my role on Lost. Yeah. As we asked, we said, look, I may do this pilot, but if you guys offer us something, just even a, a six minimum episode thing, I won't do the pilot because I, I want to preserve this on Lost because, you know, I mean, I love the role. Well, they and, wouldn't do that. And they're like, we just don't know. We can't. So I was like, well, you know, I got to pay bills, man. I got to, you know. Yeah. And look, the cane was a great opportunity in and of itself. Yeah. It was like these great casts. So I was like, I, and, but I've got to also feed the family. Right. So, so I went, I did cane. I had a blast on cane. And then I go back and then they call me back on Lost. And I was like, oh, they need me now on Lost. And then I, I remember landing in Hawaii and I remember telling Jack Bender, I go, don't kill me off. Do not kill me off on the show. I don't know that this pilot's gonna get picked up. So I, please don't kill me off. <laughs> and he goes, what's it about? He goes, well, it's about this, you know, wealthy uh, Cuban family and, you know, that is in the rum business and, you know, Florida. He goes, it's about rich people in Florida. He goes, that's never gonna go. You know, so yeah, just conceptually, he's like, that's not gonna get picked up. And sure enough, it gets picked up and they don't kill me off. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no. I mean, I'm like now, wow. I hope I didn't put the show in a pickle, but you know, but not now, your fault, but it's now, you know, so not my fault. So sure enough, you know, but now I was like, I hope we're able to work around, you know, and I did 13 episodes of Kane. It didn't go beyond that. But as I'm doing that, I'm hoping, I hope they bring me back on Lost. And sure enough, Kane, you know, Kane gets killed through the writer's strike. And then, and then Lost does call me back and I, and I go, great. And then at that point we're like, hey, can we do a deal, anything, you know? And they're like, we just don't know where the role's going. And they didn't know, they didn't know. So very long story, I, you know, continue doing Lost and then another opportunity comes up and it's just a, t a six episodes to test for Kath and Kim, you know, to, you know, to play one of them. And they're forced, you forced their hand inadvertently and. And that's when they made the deal. Those bastards. But listen. It's just the way of the business. I know they're trying to save money. No. They don't want to make you a regular. It's like you know, and they don't. They know. knew how an integral, you know. I mean, part listen, it was. they they do and they don't. I, I, to be fair, I I don't. You know, when, when it's that, and there's a lot of characters. That's what I'm saying. Is like, yeah, I and, know that's and, true. And if you get on the other side of it as a producer, you have to think. Look, it's not an unlimited budget, you know, and and these things get inflated very quickly, and it's crazy where they start cutting, and they have to because they have to justify it. So I get the other side of it, you know. Yeah, it's just the business. Yeah, it's just yeah. the it's just the nature of it, and until you learn leverage, you 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 don't know what you know what you have, and it's not a you know not, there's no animosity there. It's just it's just understanding how it works, you know. Yeah, you know, you we were talking originally about before that story and the other story, which are great stories, but we were talking about like, you you know, you didn't mind being guest stars. And that's yeah. because you especially have, I mean, I don't want to say lucked out, but you have I worked hard out. and proven yourself 
And they're like, whoa, we got to bring this guy back over and over again. It even happened on Bates Motel, right? Weren't you a guest star on that? Well, or they, like a recurring? Well, well, Bates was different. Bates was, you know, I'd worked with Carlton Cuse on Lost. You know, he was one of the exact producers on that show. And so he asked me to come and do Bates. But it was, again, they didn't have the money to make me a regular. Right. So it was like, look, this will be a recurring. We'll give you, this is what we can afford first season. If there's chemistry between you and Vera, we're thinking long play there, and then we'll make a regular second season. And so that's what happened. So, so. It, but still sort of like, that's sort of the same thing. There was an if, it's but, sort of but an But you proved yeah. yourself as an actor and they're like, oh my God, we got to get this guy. Well, you're right. But then again, you know, Michael, you know this more than anyone is that as an actor that you're, you're always kind of auditioning for your job. Yeah. You know, until you somehow become somewhat ind indispensable to the storyline, and it's r rare that that happens, you're, you're always kind of auditioning for that role to stay relevant as a part of the show and to be asked back season after season, because yeah. you have to get that letter every June. Uh, that where they pick up your option and and you have to be integral to that show. So I learned that the hard way on Suddenly Susan, um, you know, or I, I didn't, I don't know, I learned it that I saw it, you know. Brooke Shields, right? Yeah, yeah, great, Love, lovely, great, great group of people, all amazing, incredible. That was the beginning. Andrew Green, Andrew what's Green. up? Yeah, there you go. We love you. Absolutely, Steve Peterman, Gary Donsick, <laughs> incredible. And I just had lunch with him. You did that three years, right? We did four years. Four years. Yeah, and so, but I remember, uh, uh, I don't know if um, if you read for, uh, now I'm blanking on his name, but head of casting at Warner Brothers for the longest time, Tony Sepulveda. Yes. Tony Sepulveda. I call him Sepulveda. Sepulveda. <laughs> Old Tony. Good old Tony, man. So Tony cast uh, Suddenly Susan amongst many of the NBC shows. He was my Groundlings teacher. Yes, he was. That's right. He yeah. was a Groundlings teacher. He's incredible. Mm -hmm. He kept trying to recruit me together. I was like, no, I'm too scared. It's great. I, I heard it's amazing. Oh, man, it really I could see you being I amazing. loved it. I loved yeah. it. But Tony, I remember at the end of the first season, he said, do you realize that every that there was at least one guest spot was hired, was fired every week at the t after the table read on the first season? And it was, and I look back and I go, he's right. Somebody was fired, and I won't say oh, what names. Some, some names I've been fired off a table, um, and it's and it's especially in that world, the sitcom world. Is it's so unless you're hitting it at the table, there's no job security, and you're proving it at every run through, and you're fighting for those jokes at every run through, and and it's it's a very much a fear based medium. You've done a, a, a bit of a half hour too, right? Four cameras, yeah, yeah exactly. So you know, you my buddy John, uh, I won't say his last name. <clears throat> I don't think he gives a shit. But he did a table read for a Will Ferrell, who is Ferrell's partner, Adam McKay at the time. They had this TV show and he flew to wherever and he did the table read and he went to his room and his agent called him and said, hey man, they let you go. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, the table read, I guess, didn't go well. They're looking for somebody different. And he's like, so he had to get on a plane and fly back. Sure. Yeah, that's fucking brutal. Yeah, it's happened to me. Do you get how? Yeah. How do you how, how do you remember feeling? Oh, awful. Just completely You've, rejection, I, rejection. I, oh, listen, I remember it happened to me, and then I I got off the phone, and my son was there, and I was like, I just got fired, and he's like, and he's amazing. His response was, "You'll get another one," and he's like, I was like, thank you for that, and that was so sweet of him. But it's it's one of those things where you just go. You take the blow, you take the hit, and you know, obviously, you 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 pick yourself up, and you know, day at a time kind of thing. But you can't help but take it personally. It, there's a million reasons why. Yeah. There's what's there's wrong so, with me? It, it, what is it? Why? Yeah. Am I not? Maybe I'm not that great. They found it, me out. I'm not a great actor. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm the imposter that I always thought I was. It's there's a million reasons. It's bullshit. It's because fear based, and they didn't come and say, hey. Um, Let's talk to you about the role, you know, the reading. We, we cast you for a reason. You could more energy, whatever. They just fire you. It's so or, stupid, or, arbitrary. Or there's always been uh, a hang up about hiring you in the first place, and they had someone else in mind, and they never got their way. And there's there's so there's all of these things that are layered mm -hmm. with these decisions. Yeah, that out some, of your control. Some of them are out of your control. Some are not, but some are out of your control. You can't guess which ones are which. You know, I hate table. I, they're I, awful I, they're I, awful because you don't know if you're giving too much energy or they think i'm going to be like this in the show or and maybe i'm like this i'm like oh no he's kind of boring and I, well, you, fuck you and fuck listen, you and, listen, and 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 you write I'm, i know you're right right you, you're right or you, you've written yeah yeah so you know do you find that a table read is helpful to you as a writer oh absolutely 
just you, to, you to read. I've had some pilots read that I've written and having friends come over and read them and bring them to life. Absolutely. It, it brings life to them. And I also, when I hear them out loud, I go, yeah, yeah, that's not what I want in my head. Interesting. Obviously. But um, yeah, I think it does help you as a writer. It helps you you know, what you have on the page sometimes is your own voice is your, is what you're hearing. But when other people, when you actually hear it out loud from other people, it can make you just change directions or go, yeah, yeah, I need yeah. more of that. I need less of that. But, um, that's it, not the answer I was looking for. No, no. I write and I, 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 I don't need no. to hear other people say, oh, you don't. It. <laughs> I mean, I normally don't, but I have done it. No, but no, listen, I, but I know other writers <laughs> are like you. Most of them are like, I need to hear it. I was like, no, I don't. No, know you don't. No. My writing is, I'm a Harvard grad. No, no. You no, don't. No. I studied English. I don't need people to hear and read my shit. It's, it's flawless. It's flawless. It's absolutely well, not the reason. It's because I feel like it's the table read's never going to be an accurate representation of how this is going to play out on its feet, mm -hmm. what actors are going to bring to it, you know, how they're going to interpret it. It's never going to be that. And, you know, you can kind of already hear, like, I know it doesn't work on the page when I'm reading it. So I know it'll definitely, there's no one who can make this work. Yeah. You know, that's just the way I feel about it. I understand. It. I don't no, know. I, let me ask you this real quick, because there's a couple more things I want to talk to you about. Um, and then we get some rapid fire questions. But, God, I mean, there's so much I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about, for, we're going to definitely talk about your your wife's book. Oh. And it's great. It looks amazing. You've already uh -huh. told me, you'll, you'll fill me in. All is not lost shannon kenny how i friended failure on the island and found a way home if this doesn't make you like our listeners i mean go ahead go ahead and, and listen and, i can't gush about my wife enough she's incredible you brought this and you're like i think it makes sense for your show and i'm like please i, I didn't want to do a shameless plug but i thought having having listened to your show and thinking this this might be right up your alley this is about my wife gave up her career to be a full-time mom when her second son was born. Wow. She was pregnant with uh, with Marco as she was working on Seventh Heaven. You know, she was on that. And when, when, as soon as she was born, she's like, I just can't do it. I go, I, not that women shouldn't be able to do, do both. She goes, I know myself, I can't not be home and give this child, both of them, what they, you know, all of me. And she's like, you know, if it's cool with you, it's on you to just be the full-time actor. And I was like, are you sure you want to give that up? Because this is a woman who, had no money when she came here, got into Juilliard, couldn't afford to go to Juilliard, uh, was able to win a scholarship at CalArts, did every job you can imagine, scrubbing toilets, anything, just to pay for you know, the living expenses to be able to go to that school. And then she, this is all she ever wanted to do. And, and, and uh, she paid for the first year of actually uh, from, uh, from uh, working as a, a soap opera in Australia, her first year of, of college, and then subsequently won that scholarship. So this is a woman who sacrificed everything to, to, for this career. And then she gives it all up after a 20 year career in film and TV and theater to do this. And then she's like, after the kids are somewhat self-sufficient, she's like, finds this cavity in her body is thinking like, oh my God, this creative spirit that I had nurtured for years what do I do with this? It's like this giant hole. And I know I should be grateful for these kids, but by the same token, I'm like, I've just, there's a death inside that me. That spark is, yeah. It, is, is gone. And I, I, you know, so it, it brought this incredible spiral. And this all came to a head while I was, shoot, while we all moved to Hawaii and, and uh, I was, for me to do Lost, they all, we put the kids in school there and it was all, all kind of coming to, she sort of crash landed on the island, kind of like the plane did. And it was her whole experience that year. That book is all about that. And it, wow. so if you're ever going through, you know, a, a moment where you are completely lost as she was in, in terms of your identity, she identified herself so much as this actress and, and you've lost that identity and you're no longer that, and you've lost this dream and you've come short of your dream in the way that you envisioned it. You had to give it up for something else. It, this book is, uh, you know, I think will really speak wow. to Wow, that's amazing. I mean, just the, the thought of, you know, sometimes even like on another level, it's like maybe you've, um, that thing that you've always wanted to do. And that was what your most, your part, a big part of you is gone, but maybe you have a different path or maybe you have a different whatever, or you're trying to get that spark back or there's all these different things and thoughts. And on the back of the book, the, the personal memoirs, I guess, I mean, look, look at this. You say Vera Farmiga, right? Yeah. Um, Shannon's touching, chucklesome, and shoot from the ovaries testimony <laughs> reminds me that those obligatory ruts in life, be it bereavement, heartbreak, or stuckness, are things that are happening for me, not to me, for me, not to me, 
How do we unleash the energy to move ahead of our creative dead ends? How do we overcome the unseen forces that stand in the way of inspiration? Read this gorgeous narrative. You just may give yourself the confidence and permission to move past your feeling of being stuck. It's beautifully written. I think that speaks for itself. It, Holy shit. It's incredible. And 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 she's she's right on every level and and it's also it, and she's right. It's a chucklesome in the sense that the, uh the, the there's a lot of humor in it and Shannon, you know, even though she's going through all this pain, uh is not uh, she's a very funny person and, yeah. and and so she finds the humor even in in and the irony in a lot of these situations. But it's yeah, beautifully written by. All is not lost. How I friended failure on the island and found a way home. Get this book. Shannon Kenny. Oh, thank you, buddy. I, I mean, I'm, this is just apropos. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for this. I want it autographed. Um, also, uh, I have to ask you, what's it like kissing Vera Farmiga? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna plead the fifth there. Come on. <laughs> you can't answer that, can you? I can't, no. She's a lovely, listen, she's a very good friend. You're very professional. No, I always talk about Kristen Krug kissing her on, on the small balls. Like, it was amazing. Listen, great, great breath. Listen, it's. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer. No, me. she's a listen. She's a very good friend of mine, and, and she is. I I have always loved her. Amazing. I think she's brilliant since I saw her in The Departed. She's incredible. I was like, this is an actress I will always watch. She's extraordinary. She really, truly is. And even at, you know, we did five years together. We worked five years, and and there was never a moment where I I was wasn't just like completely shocked or impressed by her insane range, you know. And oh, her, man, you know, one of the here's a, one one thing you always pick up things from from actors that you admire. And one of the things I picked up from her because she had so much material. She had these huge speeches and monologues and stuff in the middle of these scenes, beautifully written by Carrie Aaron. And, but she would get these and she's like dealing with kids, you know, at home and this and that. And they're young and trying to memorize this stuff at three in the morning and, you know, you know, crying, the kids crying. And she would get there and, you know, and she would flub. And it's interesting that when you watch actors flub and they go up on a line, how they react. And usually I, I, I know I'd, I'd, I'd heard that you were an athlete or you, or you, did, you did sports growing up, yeah. and hockey and everything. Yeah. You know, and there's just, to me, I wrestled and I, you know, I played soccer and you know, I was not particularly good, but I, uh, you know, I loved sports, but I, if I mess up, I try to muscle through it. It's like, you know, and I t tend to tighten up a little bit. I would see her flub and I'd do the, and I'd see her do the opposite. And she would just kind of do this thing where she goes, ah, and she would turn into jello. And I was like, what is she doing? And then I was like, oh my God, of course. You know, you She's can't relaxing. Re you can't remember anything when you're tight. How could you possibly feel anything when you're tight other than tightness? You're not gonna be open to anything. And it's certainly not gonna help your memory to suddenly beat yourself up because you forgot the line. And I was like, I was like, I'm stealing that. For sure, I'm stealing it. <laughs> that is awesome. And it is. And it's like interesting what you learn from different talents that you admire. And that was certainly one thing I was like, oh my God, I'm taking that home. Well, we didn't, we didn't even get into this, but it's like, you know, I, I didn't know you directed a lot. You direct a lot. You create your own stuff. You like, you're doing it. You're not just an actor for hire. No. You're like a triple threat. No, I don't know about that. You I'm, are. You, I mean, well, I mean, I'm trying, you know, and you know, Michael, it's like anything. Look, you're, you have this incredibly successful podcast. You're doing things uh, outside. Not really of, successful. No, incredibly so. <laughs> incredibly so. And you know, you too, Ryan, both of you guys have this incredible podcast. And so. No, as you know, we all know, but you kick around long in this in, in this business, so you have to create opportunities for yourself. You can't simply wait for that phone to ring. No. And I was lucky enough that Carlton Cuse and Carrie Aaron, they opened the door for me to direct on Bates Motel. So they op that opened up- You directed like three, five or something? I did three of them and, and it was an ex extraordinary experience. I, I mean, that was the biggest, one of the biggest gifts I've ever been given. You know, that opened up a whole new world. So I'm actually now going to, I think next week, I go to New York to direct Law & Order which is kind of full circle because that was the first thing I guessed it on uh, in prime time 31 years ago. Wow. So now I have, I'm so blessed to be able to, amazing. to go and direct it. And so. you you did The Good Doctor. You worked again, what you directed yes. an episode with- A, the a couple episodes high, with, uh, with Freddie Highmore. Yeah. Freddie Highmore, who's yeah. awesome. Who's amazing. Who was yeah. in Bates Motel, who then The Good yeah. Doctor, you went and directed that, which yeah. probably had to be special because you know him and you probably got the best out of him and he loved working with you. He probably said, yes, bring him. Yeah, I'd worked with the the, the writer, uh, you know, with David Shore, with for another show, obviously with Freddie, and Daniel Day Kim produces on that show, and I yeah, worked with him on Lost. I love him. So I happened to know three different people, you know. So that that was a that was another another gift. 
and yeah, I've been lucky enough to to you know do do a few other shows. Uh, New Amsterdam, I, I most recently I did three episodes on that show. It was, it was such are a, you do you do you feel like you're sort of gravitating towards more directing and you not as much acting, or you just want to do whatever? No, I think I, I'm open to to whatever, and I think you know I mean I don't know how you feel about this. Whenever I'm doing one genre, I'm, I'm I, as soon as I finish that, I'm aching to do something completely different. I, do you feel that way? No, no, I don't. Do, <laughs> uh, I usually uh, do something and then go. Let's take a little break. Let's relax. Okay. No, I don't mean like you have to jump right away, but in terms of creatively, do you feel like- My mind now, I think I was I was dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression stuff for like a last year or so. And I wasn't in the great greatest place. I just didn't feel like me. And now it's starting to come around. In fact, someone said last night, I started going on about, I got this project with my, my buddy that um, these guys want to do. And then I got this other thing. And then I'm, uh, I wrote this one and I start talking. She goes- do you hear yourself right now? And I go, what? She goes, this is three months ago. This is not the person that I was talking to. Okay. This is like, uh, I just want to move away. I well, let me ask you something, up. because I know this speaks to so many people, particularly with the pandemic, the shutdown, I think just in general, how did you come out of it? Like, what did you use to come out of it? <sighs> you know, it's a combination of things. I think it's, you know, it's therapy, it's exercise, it's the right, you know, meds. Yeah. For not for all people, but sure. like, you know, sometimes it helps. I notice a difference with me. Um, but also a good group of friends mm -hmm. that are here for you. Correct. They've been there. They've yeah. seen it. They you know, remember when I had an anxiety attack at my birthday dinner? Mm -hmm. Were you there? Uh no, I don't think so. I invited you, didn't I? I think we we're out of town. Oh, thank God. <laughs> That would have been awkward. But I remember going, hey, I'm having an anxiety attack. I, I think right. I should go. And they're like, just don't don't go. We're aware of it. It's okay. And I'm like, and I'm just like, you know, I feel like I was going to pass. It was just a really rotten time. And I was just on the wrong meds and getting on the right meds. And it just was like, I just wasn't me. And for the last couple of years, I just felt like I'm just drifting away from who I am. And exactly your wife's book, you know, All Is Not Lost, which I'm going to read. Um, And with a combination of all those things that I, I spoke of, I feel like I have, um, I'm putting it all back together. Mm -hmm. And yet there's sort of this, there's less pressure on myself now and more excitement knowing that I have the choice, which we always do you get most of the time, if you're lucky, to do what you want to do. And you don't have, try to do something you enjoy. Try to, try to add an element of fun in it. Um, so I think it's a combination and it's like, <clears throat> you know, and so th that's what I'm, I'm going through now, but yeah. yeah. I know you told me about your back problems, which I'm sure has precluded you from doing certain kinds of, act but you say you did you did some exercise, right? Yeah, look, I, I play ice hockey on Monday nights. I play still tennis, do. yes, on Tuesday, non-contact hockey though. No, I guess. But still a very physical game, Yeah, but we don't hit each other on purpose. Um, but my thought is I could either have back pain and not play hockey and tennis and do these things and be in a little more pain than that, or I could, you know, just say, screw it. I'm gonna, you just, for my mind and for my body and the feeling of just disappearing for an hour or two while you're playing sports, I don't like hiking. I don't like doing things like lifting weights. I like competitive sports, right. football, baseball, hockey, um, tennis, golf, even golf. Golf's a little slow for me. I like a right. little, but um, I, I like the competition. I like the adrenaline. I, I like the, you know, I'm Absolutely. just like, oh, okay, this is exciting. This is a game. There's two teams. We have to win. I have to get some hits. I have to get catch a ball. I have to. That is what I really love. And that keeps my mind a little sharper than it normally would. I, no, no question. And it, it's scientific from what I've, I've learned through I had my therapist who basically said that if you get, if you, uh, get your heart rate up to 135 beats per minute for 25 to 30 minutes, four times a week, it's the equivalent of taking an antidepressant for 24 hours. Wow. It's, yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't do that. It, well, you essentially do when you're playing hockey. You're Maybe getting hockey and yeah, and tennis. You're getting your heart rate up for at least thirty minutes, over 135 beats per minute. Maybe not continuously, but over the course of it, probably cumulatively, you will have. Right. You'll, That's amazing. I notice now. I box now, not like sparring, but I, I trained. You know, if I don't do it, I I feel the down. 
Yeah. But if I do do it, I feel an endorphin rush that does last me 24 hours. It's extraordinary. And I think, I don't know if you saw the Jonah Hill documentary. Yeah. Or, okay, I, 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 I've got to finish it. I've watched half of it. But 85%, stut, is it Stutz? Uh, Stutz. Uh, Stutz. Stutz, Stutz, yeah. Stutz. Stutz, the it's, it's, Psychi psychiatrist psychiatr or psychotherapist, yeah. Yeah, he says 85% of your therapy is, is, uh, is working out, is physical. And and it's no so it's 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 extraordinary what that I think that's true, but I also think there's a big component in therapy in working your shit out with oh, someone. There's no question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that. no question. But yeah, I think exercise and therapy, those two with exercise, you're you you know you're, you you have the ability to, yeah, to get but where you want to be. Exactly. In, right. in terms of getting yourself off of that uh, or having a baseline there to work with, mm -hmm. certainly exercise is is as valuable. You know, in, in some cases, as an antidepressant, it can be. Can yeah, be, can be. All right, this is shit talking with Nestor Carbonell. <laughs> oh no, say your name again in Spanish. Nestor Carbonell. Nestor Carbonell. You say Carbonell? Eh? No, Carbonell. 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 Say, sure. Yeah. Ryan, Carbonell. you're half Mexican. <laughs> uh, Nestor Carbonell. Hey, that's pretty good. Nestor Carbonell. Nestor Carbonell. Hablas español? Ah, sí. Sí, cómo no. Sí. Bienvenidos a los Estados Unidos. Sí, me llamo ese Lex Luthor. Tú lo hablas muy bien. Sí, sí. Muchas gracias. I, I, no, I'm half Mexican, but my dad never learned Spanish growing up did you learn it in school no i took latin and i didn't remember that either oh, <laughs> very very useful quad, no, quad nomen mi yes. latino <laughs> quad nomen mi yes. la plume de matante it's from the exorcist <laughs> when she speaks latin you know i remember i went to uh cabo or something i got the plane this guy recognized me years ago he's like mr luthor <laughs> or my mr rosenbaum give me a call and i'll uh, take care of you it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, I still have a message. He called me. I, I don't know why. But I, I gave him my number, and he goes, "Hey, Mr. Luthor, it's, uh, hey, I need. Uh, I want to give you a deal." But he, he was, was so like, cool. You, I want to make a deal with a Luthor. Mr. Luthor, we go to, uh, <laughs> we'll go swimming. We'll do all these things with your group. Come on, give me a call. That's pretty cool. Shit talking with Mr. Carbonell. These are from my top tier patrons. The the patrons Patreon saves the podcast. It's folks like you patreon.com slash um inside of you here we go rapid fire you got to answer oh God, fa relatively oh, fast no. kelly s you're simply charming i love oh. your work lost Bates, the morning show we didn't even get into the morning yeah. show the weatherman they're my favorites how uh. did you prepare for the role as alex romero in Bates motel and really get into that character that's so sweet of her uh, how did i prepare for alex romero um, I remember, I remember coming to the set, you know, you know how in theater you put on the shoes first when you get the first day of rehearsal, you know, sure. you start with the shoes cause you get into the thing. I remember I came in with a mustache. I'd grown a mustache cause I was like, this guy's got a stash for sure. And I, and I was like, you know, I had this like massive thing that I was really happy about. I landed in Vancouver and Carlton Cuse is there and he's like, Hey man, I like the stash, but uh, I think we're going to lose it. And I was like, Oh no, there's, that's like my theater shoes. So I was like, but at least the stash gave me a grounding to start with. Like, this is a guy who makes no bones about who he is. Even, you know, it doesn't care. So I started with a stash. Do you grow, you grow a good one, don't you? Yeah, back, back then it was not bad. It wasn't bad. I want to see it. You got to email me one. I, I'll, I, I, won't, I won't. Actually, I actually have, yeah. Do you have one right now? You know how you like, you have a picture. Let me see it. It'll take 10, ten minutes. Get it out. 10 minutes for me to scroll through I got to see this because I can't gonna, grow Ryan, mustache. you're going to have to edit this. Now I got to turn <laughs> this the phone. Just turning the phone on is going to be 10 minutes yeah. here. Let me turn <laughs> no, the phone on. Jason will edit this. Okay. okay. All right, real quick, Jules M. I love your performance on Psych. Was oh, the experience as wonderful as it looked? I love James. I love Dulé. Maggie was on the podcast. Maggie Lawson. It's amazing. Uh, it's such a blast working on that show. So, I mean, it's so much, as you know, improvising. Did you do the show? No. They never uh, asked me. Uh, amazing. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Little Lisa, do you have any behind the scenes stories you could tell or share when filming Dark Knight with Christopher Nolan? Oh my God. Dark Knight. With yes, I do. A quick one. All right. So I, uh, I have to do a speech on Dark Knight that it's not scripted on the page. You know, it's just like, yeah, the, the mayor says a few words, this and that, and I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, so you know what? I'll just write something, you know? And cause I'll give the speech and then the, the joker's supposed to kill me or try to kill me. And I'm like, oh, I better write something. So I wrote something here I am writing Chris Nolan's script. And I, so I get to, I had done a scene the day before I get to the hotel, it's in Chicago. And uh, all of a sudden there's a speech waiting for me there. And I'm going, they're giving me the speech now. And it's like this long speech. 
And I go, I had this idea of what I was going to say. I was like, well, why was I thinking that that was ever going to go? But now I was like, now I got to memorize. Did o'clock you have to night. memorize that? Yeah. And it was like 10 o'clock at night. I was like, what? Were you stressed? Yeah. Were you nervous? Of course. Anxiety? Yeah, massive. And it's like, there's going to be 1,200 extras. How did you do it? Awfully. So I, I, I was up all night learning it. Finally, I, I, I remember being there with 1200 you know extra background workers there in the middle of the financial district of chicago i'm supposed to give this speech you know and he's using an imax camera which is like 200 grand a take is what i'm thinking like these things are massive and so expensive and uh and sure enough i'm doing this i have to walk in this parade with uh with maggie gyllenhaal and you know and, and then and so I, I i go to maggie i was like maggie can you just look at this i didn't even know her i was like i just didn't see if i'm off book here and so i'm like running lines with maggie as we're walking <laughs> and finally i get to the podium and i like to give the speech and i don't want to read off i was like that's so lame they had it though they had it there if i wanted to read oh i, I would have done that i would have no but then oh. it's like then you don't really know it i gotta read this eh. but that's what a mayor would do he'd kind of read things eh. and go hey yeah. or or usually they have those prompters where you, you know, you know, and like, they would cut away. Yeah, you know, but I was like, but. no, but no, but I didn't want it. So I wanted it, I wanted it to be. So sure enough, I'm like going up. And then like on the first take, like I kind of go up. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, fuck, I'm going up and there's 1,200 people. And then there's Chris Nolan, there's got an iPad that he's suing it, seeing it all on an iPad, not far off the set. And then I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, can we go again? He's like, and he goes, Nestor, it's just me. It's just me. And I go, Chris, it's exactly, it's just you. <laughs> it's Chris. <laughs> oh my God. But it was in that moment, he really truly relaxed me. And I was like, this guy is like amazing. So, you know, Jesus. it was like, all of a sudden I was like, dude, you're super cool. And uh, and that was that. That was pretty, it was pretty cool, cool for Maggie to read with you. Uh, how cool is that? Uh, Raj, where were you when you found out you were first cast on Lost and how did you react? Well, we already know that. You already answered that question. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you when I got, got the Dark Knight where I was. Where? I was in the jungles, in, in the jungle in Hawaii, shooting Lost and my phone rings as my manager. Oh, actually, this is interesting. And he goes, uh, I had read for Chris Nolan four months ago. And I was like, whatever, it obviously didn't happen. And so I, I'm in, the, I'm there with Michael Emerson, you know, in, you know, in the middle of the jungle, in between takes, and I'm going, why did I pick? I picked it up. My manager's like, hey, so Chris Nolan wants to, um, wants to know uh, uh, if he can see some tape on you. And I go, for what movie? He goes, the Batman one. He goes, that was like four months ago. And I, and I go, yeah, because I just send him this reel of this stuff. I go, no. I would just done Smoke and Aces that hadn't come out, and it was with a, Matthew Fox. It happened to be I ended up killing Matthew Fox, which right. was another weird coincidence. <laughs> and then I'm going, I'll oh, see if we can get Joe Carnahan to send him those scenes because that's the most recent stuff, and it's Universal. I don't know. Ma Carnahan was such a mensch. My manager calls Joe Carnahan. They send over, uh, you know, a spliced together performance, 15 minutes of my work to. To, to Chris Nolan, I get a call back, you know, days later in Hawaii, dude, you're, you're doing The Dark Knight. I mean, you know, so those are those <sighs> moments that you're like, you know, those are the those are the highs for sure. Jeez. Plenty Last, of lows, there's plenty of lows. Oh, those I are know, oh, I know. Last plenty question, Ray H, ha, da, da. have there been any characters you played where it was particularly hard to connect with them? With a character, many. Many, many where you're like, wow, this is like, my foot doesn't fit in the shoe, you know? And, and uh, usually sometimes those are offers where you're like, I didn't read for this. <laughs> and they got me. And, and, yeah. uh, and that is the beauty and the curse of an offer. He's like, I, I, hope, I always say that. You know, you just, you, you're like, I didn't read for it. So I hope they're cool with this interpretation of this character. Yeah, there have been some where that it doesn't, it's not organic and you got to make it work. And then eventually you, you hope you do. And uh, yeah, but there have been, there have been more than a few for sure. This has been awesome. I, I love it. Awesome. Honestly, you're just as what I thought it would be. It's no, just, just so easy. I told him, I go, this is going to be like such a, I go, I wish I was as laid back or no, appear, appear to be laid back. But All you're so appearances. honest and humble too. It's like you're telling your story and like, you know, between you your are, family. Michael, and, as are you, Ryan. Here's the thing, dude. I mean, look, we get the privilege of being this incredible business. We get the privilege to tell stories for a living. I yeah. mean, that's an incredible. They help people, and, and yeah, you know, and and you and you hope that if you can get, give somebody respite from their day, and so if they've had a bad day, you do. If you happen to inspire them in some way, fantastic. But we have we have to have perspective. We're not curing cancer here. Yeah, you know, I mean, not that not that nope, those are, not that those are the, it's a binary choice. But I'm just saying, you know, you you know, we're we're part of we're a cog in the wheel that tells a story. And if you don't, if you lose perspective of that, oh, good, good luck to you, man. Amen on that. Uh, what's your handle so people could follow you? Oh, on Instagram, I'm I'm uh, at Nestor Carbonella, and then on Twitter, 
uh, at, at Carbonell Nestor. At Carbonell Nestor. Yeah, from from the people who, you know, on the back of this book that your, 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 uh, your wife, you guys are friends with these people and people just, people. I mean, people like working with you. They uh, like you as a person. They like your wife. You're just genuine people. And I think that people want to work with other good people. Thank they you, want buddy. life to be as easy as they can. Well, thank you. And I, I'm, I know people feel that way about you. And I appreciate that. Uh, I know they do. Um, I've heard that from so many people. And no. I, I know that to be true. Thanks, um, thank you, buddy. I think, you know, I think uh, uh, being, being grateful for what we get to do, I think, it, it, I, think, I think it helps, you know, I think it helps in terms of keeping perspective like we were talking about before, you know, and then, and just staying grounded, man. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, the, and having your friends around you to keep you grounded. No question. We, as you spoke to before, the, I, I, I would love to speak to all my lows because I've had plenty of them. You know, it, you, you, you kind of, I feel like someone said it really well. I was like, I want to operate at a seven out of 10. I don't want to get too high and I don't want to get too low. If right. I'm at a seven, I can deal with the ups and downs a bit better. And I think it's yeah. finding that seven and not getting too worked up about those highs, too, too worked up about the lows can give you some sanity. Are your parents still with you? Yeah, thankfully, yes, yeah. How old are they? So my dad just turned 87 on the 5th, and then my mom is uh, 76. And they're in New York? They're in, yeah, in Connecticut. In Connecticut, Connecticut. Yeah, 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 you still yeah. talk to them a lot? All the time. Are they proud of you? They're sweet, yes, they're very sweet. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're like my mom's like my agent, you know, <laughs> my dad too. I love it. Super sweet, man. But I, I wish, I wanted to get more into you as well and into the- <laughs> Maybe uh, next time. I would, I, if I hope there is Maybe one. Maybe next time. <laughs> I love you, hey, thank love you. you. Thank you guys. That was thank awesome. You. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Nestor. Although he, he, in the podcast, he says Nestor. Nestor. I, Nestor. I loved hearing him Nestor. say his name. Nestor. Nestor Carbonell. Nestor Carbonell. Nestor Carbonell. Dude. <laughs> The guy's got everything. Yeah. He's got talent. He's got looks. He's a sweetheart. He was a great guest on the podcast. Married to an author. Married to an author. Mm. <laughs> You've really done it, buddy. <laughs> All right. Top tier patrons. Uh, you're going to help me out with this? Sure. Let's do it. You mean to read off of it for the first time ever? I I'm not going to be good with... Uh, why don't you read them, see if I can come up with... Nancy D. Leah. No, no, no. Oh, you, oh, you, oh, you want to just... D. Okay, Nancy. Leah. S. Kristen. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, 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 I see what you're doing. Leah S. Kristen K. Uh huh. Little. Lisa. U. Kiko. Jill. E. Brian. H. Nico. P. Robert. B. Jason. W. Sophie. M. Mm hmm. Raj. C. Joshua. D. Jennifer. Jennifer. I want to say N or L. N. Mm -hmm. Yep. Stacy. Stacy's mom has <laughs> got it going on. It was one of the first, one of the two letters you just said. Stacy L. Mm hmm. Jamal. M. No. No, Jamal. Jamal F. Yep. Janelle. B. Mike. E. Oh, there's a lot of these. <laughs> you just read them now? Eldon Supremo. Are you? Yeah. Is that right? Was yeah, he no, next? that was right. Yeah, that was correct. Eldon Supremo. What's the next one? Uh. Wait, you got to give me the first name. 99. More. 99 more. Sant Santiago. M. Chad. Chad W. <laughs> Leanne. Leanne P. Maddie. S. Belinda. B. N. Mm -hmm. N. Dave. Hole. Dave Hole. Sheila. G. Brad. T. Brad G. Brad, no, Brad L. No. What is it? D. Brad D. Brad, Brad D. Brady. Yeah. All, right. All right, we should go now. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so, well, I, I, I got, I got, I got, give me a couple more. All right. Uh, Ray. Harada. Tabitha. T. Tom. N. Uh huh. Talia. M. Yep. Betsy. D. Angel. B. Angel. I want to say F. Angel. P. 
Angel M. Mm-hmm. Rhiannon. C. Corey. K. Dev. Nexon. Michelle. K. Nope. Michelle. <laughs> Michelle A. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I did all right. I never do That's that. Pretty good. Michelle A, Jeremy C, Brandy D, Yavor, Joey M, Eugene and Leah, Corey, Jake Busey, Angela F, Mel S, Christine S, Eric A, Shane R, Andrew M, Tim L, Amanda R, Jen B, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Jarrell, Jim and J, Leanne J, Luna R, Mike F, Stone, Henge, H, you fuck. <laughs> Brian L, Kendall L, Meredith I, Kara C, Jessica B, Kyle F, Marisol P, Esteban G, Kaylee J, Brian A, Ashley F, Marion Louise Lifus L. That's how I'll remember that. Marion Louise Dreyfus Lifus. Mm-hmm. Romeo B, Romeo's Bleeding. Veronica <laughs> Q, Frank B, Jen T, Nikki L, April R, Cassie B, Derek N. Thank you guys for all your love and your support and patreon.com slash inside of you. Um, I'm Michael Rosenbaum. I am Ryan Taylor from the Hollywood, Hollywood Hills, Hills in California. California. All, right. all right. Give it away. Thanks. Thanks so much for uh, listening today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, be good to yourself. Mm-hmm.